morning. Good morning. I'd just like to take this time and opportunity to say welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. I believe God's got something great in store for us at our uh, children's church today. We'll, uh, in a few minutes later, a little, little bit later, we'll uh, come forth and uh, bring us a, uh, a Christmas gift. We're thankful for that. You know, we hear a lot today, uh, at this time of year, even in America, we have that argument, uh, is it Merry Christmas or is it Happy Holidays? Where I stand before you today, it's Merry Christmas for me. I mean, Jesus is the reason for the season. All my life, most of my life, my mom has a big Bible, and she opens it up at this time of the year, and she lays it out on the table, and it's got the Christmas story in there, and I want to take a minute and just read that to you if I could. It's uh, in Luke 2, and I'm going to start in verse 8, and it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a beggar wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favors rest. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds were said to them, had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they would been, had been told. I like that last part right here. So they heard off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word. And once you've had an encounter with Jesus, that's what you want to do. You know, those who say happy holidays, I don't really have any issue with them because they don't know Jesus as God's only begotten Son and as Lord and Savior. But those of us who do, we know the reason for this season, and that's why we're celebrating. We're celebrating what God has given to us, salvation through His Son, Jesus. I want to read one more couple verses. This comes out of Isaiah. This is before Jesus was born. This was a prophecy, and it came to pass just like chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the season. And Father, I stand before this congregation today believing that you are Jesus to reason for the season. And I praise you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins, and not only for mine, but for all who would believe them. The sins of the whole world, if they've come to ask Jesus in their heart, their sins will be forgiven, and they'll be given that eternal life. And Father, as we go through the service today, I ask God that our hearts will be open to whatever you're doing today. By your Spirit, move upon us, Father, in a mighty way, that we can be comforted, we can be encouraged, and we can be strengthened at this time, Lord, to carry the gospel, just like those shepherds. 2,000 years ago, here the gospel we to tell people what they heard, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, has been born, that he has died for our sins, and God, you've raised him, and because he lives, those who believe in him will live forever, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, let's give us some praise this morning. Are you guys happy to be here? Happy to be here in the house of the Lord? Go ahead and stand to your feet. Let's give him some praise. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome to Gospel Temple Worship Center. This is the place to start over. Amen. Amen. So we welcome our visitors here today. You are our VIPs. You have the VIP treatment. Out at the front, we have parking spaces designated for you. And we just welcome you into this, this family, this fellowship of believers. And this is a family. Amen. Amen. So we're here to do life together. We're here to grow in the gospel together. Amen. So we're just so glad that you are here. We have a special service here today. 
our kids are going to minister to us a little bit. Amen? So looking forward to that. Let's go ahead and jump on in to the announcements. Tonight, 6 p.m., the Faith Force Youth Christmas Party is going to happen there in the, uh, the youth building. There's going to be games, food, prizes. Who's eligible for those prizes? Can I come and, and win a prize? No. All right, amen. There's going to be prizes, a costume contest, and please bring a 5 to $10 uh, gift for the exchange that's going to happen there tonight. It's going to be a fun time. I saw the graphic for it, and I just got excited. I'm like, woo, you guys just have a blast. Have a blast. Yeah. If you've never been to youth before, don't feel like you can't come tonight. That's right. If you've never been to youth before, don't feel like you can't come tonight. Amen? So bring a neighbor, find somebody on the, in the mall, and just grab them and say, all right, let's go to youth. Just come on and bring them. So uh, this is going to be a really exciting uh, party that's going to happen here tonight, 6 to 8 tonight, so make plans to attend that. Tomorrow night is our prayer focus gathering. That's, at, that's Monday night, 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Some awesome things are happening, so please come out and, uh, and just pray with us. Amen. We need some prayer. We need to seek the Lord. We need to fall to our knees. Amen. Especially this time of year, this season of the church. Um, outreach ministry, they're going to be traveling out to the Medford Nursing Home this afternoon, 4 o'clock. So pray for them. as they. If you want to get plugged into any of the outreach ministry, too, see Linda Spires. She's down here at the front during Fellowship. John Spires also. If you're looking for them, come find me. I'll be up here as well. The GTWC cookbooks are, are available. They are, there's a table in the foyer. So during fellowship or after service or before service next Sunday, um, those who want to purchase some, it is a fundraiser for our women's ministry and also to do some upgrades in the fellowship hall. So um, I still haven't gotten mine yet, so I will be out there because I'm always looking for uh, good eating. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I may look like I need some, some food, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, uh, and grab one of those as well. Um, also, we have that mail station out in the foyer. Uh, so if you, are, if you are looking to send out Christmas cards, uh, there's a mail station out there. Uh, Teresa Young is our postmaster. So if you want to send those out, see her, or if you want to see if you have any mail, go ahead and, and uh, check with Teresa there at the front. Um, it's going to save you postage. Uh, from having to go to the post office. Amen? Uh, there's also a box in the foyer for the Darlington Detention Center. Um, that's going to go all the way up until Christmas. So this Sunday and next Sunday as well. Uh, if you'd like to just go ahead and place any toiletries inside of that box uh, during the, the next couple of weeks. So this will be for the ladies there at the detention center. So if you have any questions... See Miss Gail Creighton, or if you can't find her during fellowship, come see me and I'll point you in the right direction. Amen. And lastly, December 30th, 5 p.m., we're going to have a members meeting here at the church. There's going to be food, fellowship, and conversation. So please block that out on your calendar. December 30th, 5 p.m. here at the church for food, fellowship, and conversation. Amen. And speaking of conversation, go ahead and stand to your feet and converse with your neighbor. Welcome him in the house of the Lord. Amen. And say Merry Christmas to him.
Okay, good morning again. Good morning. Again, I would like to say thank you for being here with us today. We certainly, uh, no matter what you got going on, you know, God is in us and anything's possible for God. So it can be a kid's drama, it can be uh, an evangelist, it could be your uh, pastor. You know, God can move in any kind of situation. And we think and ask God to do that today, that he'll do just that. He'll move and meet the needs. That's what he says. Uh, he uh, wants to meet our needs according to his uh, grace, his gifts in uh, heaven. And he can do that. And we're thankful for that. I heard a story today, uh, this week, I mean, and I want to read that right quick, and then we'll carry on. It's about Abraham Lincoln. And the reason I want to read this, because this is where it kind of uh, hit me where I was at before I gave my heart to Jesus. And it says, Abraham Lincoln went to a slave market. There he noted a young, beautiful African-American woman being auctioned off to the highest offer. He bid on her and won. He could see the anger in the young woman's eyes and could imagine that she was thinking, another white man will buy me, use me, and then discard me. As Lincoln walked off with his property, he turned to the woman and said, you're free. Yeah, what does that mean, she replied. It means that you're free. Does it mean I can say whatever I want to say? Yes, Lincoln replied, smiling. It means you can say whatever you want to say. Does it mean, she asked incredulously, that can I be, can, that can I be wherever I want to be? Be whatever I want to be. Yes, it means you can be whatever you want to be. Does it mean the woman Hesitantly said, can I go wherever I want to go? Yes, it means you are free and you can go wherever you want to go. And this is the part that hit me. Then the woman said with tears well in her eyes, I think I'll go with you. Okay. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he paid for them. He set me free. All of us free. Amen. That's what Christ did. He set us all free. And that's what I choose to do, is to follow him. Yes. Amen? And I think as Christians, let's do that because, see, we're not tied. These sins do not hold us in bondage anymore. We're set free to live for God. Just as I said earlier, uh, let's go and tell people about Jesus because there's a hurting, dying world that do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if they do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, heaven is not the eternal home. That's our job as the people of God to tell them, inform them about what Christ has done to give them that hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. As we get ready to do our tithes and offering. And just repeat with me. As we tithe and give offerings, we believe that we receive from God jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, bills paid off, debts demolished, Royalties received, gifts and surprises, checks in the mail, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, The only place in here in Bethlehem that, that you can stay, stay.
stay is a staple, and then he just pointed the way and they followed. When the shepherds were taking care of the sheep, and then they saw angels. The angels said, a new baby is get, getting born, who is king of the Jews. The angel were singing. Yes. And then the shepherds said, I think we should go there and meet him. The second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out at night. And then the wise men heard about it. And then a star appeared. We should probably follow that star. It's pointing down to the barn. So maybe we should follow it. Maybe. So the wise men went to Jesus. They gave them gifts. A stuffed animal, like a hippo one, to have at home. Some diapers, they had some wipes, they had some milk, <laughs> some shoes, some Jordans. Gold, ring, and Latimer. And I don't know how it would survive in that barn. Too stinky, too crowded, and ugh. I think he probably pooped because the room was very smelly. Thank you for coming. He's adorable. He's gonna be our best friend. I love you, and you're the best baby I ever seen. There, I said it. <laughs> the new baby is gonna change the world. Welcome to Gospel Temple's 2018 Children's Christmas Program. We are so glad you came, and we love that you're all here. It's good to see so many people here. If uh, you came just to see your kid, would you raise your hand? Gospel Temple people, would you... Uh, Give them a great big hand. If you got relatives here, raise your hand. If you're a visitor, raise your hand. Very good. So at this time, uh, I had a priest that was coming, and he couldn't show up. So without father to do, he, without father to do, we'll go ahead and start the program. Uh, <laughs> father to do, y'all miss that. He's a priest. This is the Grinch, when the Grinch got saved. <laughs> All right? All right, so at this time, we'll start the program. This is a story not about me, but how I get got saved and how it all came to be. So let's just listen. Let's just listen and see.
Of course, but one year's Christmas did not seem to come at all. There were no gifts under this tree, there were no friends to spend time with. Now listen, kids, I'm taking the presents because I cannot spend the money. Every year, you take the presents, you can't spend the No way, no way, no way. I could not spend the money. That's right. You celebrate Christmas with just the greatest gift of all. Because Christmas comes for your thing or small. Old or new. Green or blue. When you open your heart and let Jesus in, the Son of God washes away all your sin. He gives you what you like to have. It rescues you from the darkness inside. The gifts you bring are peace, love, and joy. The peace comes from knowing Him. The love we feel because of Him is the way to all how much He believes in you. Be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be which will be for all the people. Wait, it gets better. Our Savior has been born in Bethlehem. This is how you will know him. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And his heart grew three sizes that day.
Can we give him a great big hand? There we go. All right, if you, there's a lot of people took to, to put this on. There's some volunteers over there. You may be seated. Uh, if you was a volunteer, please stand up. Wave your hand so you can be recognized. Stand up, stand up. Here we go. All right, in the congregation. All right. Took a lot of people to put this on, and there's a lot of, se- lot of work behind the scenes. But we couldn't get nothing accomplished if we didn't have, just like Jesus, he is the head of the church. We have to have a director. Would you come up here, Miss Brenda? We at Gospel Temple, we, we, uh, and the King's kids, we wanted you to be our director because you are so good and you're growing and learning. And not only that, she teaches, her and her sister teach every Wednesday night the children in the back. Can you give her a great big hand? We love you very much. And can you give them a great big hand? All these wonderful actors in the making. All righty. There's Mr. John. He don't like credit, but you can give him credit anyway. <laughs> and Mr. Mark. Here we go. All right. You may be, you may exit. And if, uh, here we go. Praise our Lord. The sheep have been sheared. <laughs> Let's give them another round of praise for that. That was just awesome. That awesome, awesome, very cute. The Grinch needs saving too. That's right. Amen. Amen. So I just, I just love it when, when the kids um, just bless us and minister to us. It's just a, such a blessing to see and, uh, and have them just kind of be a part um, of what we do to honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so I'm just so thankful for the children. They are an example, a a beaming example of of how we should uh, receive the kingdom of God. It it reminds me of uh, the passage in Luke 18, 17, where Jesus um, is with the disciples, and uh, and the the children come up to him, and uh, the disciples try to get get the kids away and Jesus says assuredly I say to you whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it amen so I just pray that we receive just like these kids have have received that they're not professional uh, performers they they they've been working so hard to, to put this on for us. So I'm just so thankful for them and the, the example that they've given to each and every one of us to, to be uh, obedient, right? So they were obedient to the call. They were asked, hey, would you like to be a part of this? And they jumped at the opportunity and they did so well. They did so well um, just ministering to us. So I'm just so thankful for them. Um, it, a couple of weeks ago, the... Uh, at our prayer focus gathering, Melissa Odom brought uh, the, the three girls um, to, uh, to the prayer focus gathering. And I'm sure she thought that they were a distraction, but it was just so awesome. Because what happened, we went through our teaching, and then we went through our prayer time. And then at the end of prayer time, I got up. I was up here. I got up and started looking, and, and Melanie gave them the flags, the praise flags here in the corners. And they were just waving them around and uh, praising God and praising Jesus. And they were so present and, and in the moment. They weren't worried about what other people were thinking about them. They weren't worried about, you know, what people would say. People would mock. No, they were so present. And the, the light was radiating so much from their faces that it truly blessed me. And so that is a, just a shining example. I just want to echo what... What Pastor Keith said and, and, and just acknowledging Brenda 
right? So uh, Brenda, it's just so, so awesome that you took the, you know, the initiative, you stepped up to the plate, right? So when, when, a, when a children's program needed to, be, um, needed to be put on, Brenda jumped at the opportunity. And she doesn't have an extensive background in, in production or anything like that, but she was present. And she was obedient. And she came in, and I heard just so many people say, you know, that the number of kids that were up here, they were just praising your patience. Amen? Just praise the patience that, that, uh, um, that you had. It was, just, uh, it was just awesome to look at. So it uh, just got me thinking that, that sometimes... We won't discover the true strength of the Lord until we minister from where we think that we may be weak in. Amen? And we tend to think ministry is defined by our gifts, and it surely is that, but that's not the whole picture. That's not the whole story. So if you and I were to, to sit down and try to plan this whole thing out, here we have a, the Jesus resurrected, ascending up to heaven, and we were sitting down and trying to figure out the, the ministry and the work to go, go forward. And there were 11 disciples. And here we have Saul of Tarsus, who's about to be saved, who is a genius among geniuses, right? He was one of the most highly skilled and highly trained uh, priests, if you will. He was a disciple of Gamaliel, the intellect of the day, training in the Jewish religion. You know, if we were to write a script of, of, of how this whole thing plays out, I doubt that there's a person in the room that would, um, that would send Paul to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews, right? So I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm probably going to send Paul to the educated Jews and Peter to the Gentiles. See, Paul can debate his way into anything. He can lay it all out on the line and, and through the scriptures, he can uh, talk to the Jews and, 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 and guide them and direct them and, and to be able to debate and lay it all out on the line. And he can say, you know, this is where we're coming from. And Paul would minister to the Jews, but he was sent to the Gentile. And Peter, this rough, uneducated fisherman, was sent to the Jews. So what does that tell us? It tells us that at times the resurrecting power of Jesus can only be seen when you minister out of your weaknesses. Where you minister not where you have great strength, but out of raw obedience and, what you've, and, you, and you've done what he's called you to do. And anyone can do what they do well and call it ministry. And it's not that, that you shouldn't do that. It's just, you know, learn how to obey right? Amen. Well, I'm not good at that. Well, good. Then you are equipped, right? And you're qualified. So when it works, no one will give you the praise. They'll give God the praise. Amen? Amen. So let's open up to Luke 1. And while you guys are doing that, let's, let's go ahead and open uh, in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've already done in this service. We thank you so much and we give you so much praise for this day and this, this beautiful opportunity for us to come together and worship you and hear from you, Lord. We know that you have directed our paths. And this Christmas season, this, let's, let's key in and just open ourselves up to what it is that you have for us. That we're not going through the motions of another year. That we are in a place where we can give and give you thanks, Lord. We're so thankful for what you have shown us through the kids already. The, the shining example of the, the light that is with, within them. And so we just pray for the remainder of the service that you will open our hearts and you will open up our spirits and that we will receive, we will receive the kingdom of God as a little child. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. All right, in preparation leading up to the celebration of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the birth of of our Lord and Savior, um, I didn't want this to just be another Christmas message, right? So we hear it, we could probably recite it from memory. So when I was seeking the Lord, I was saying, God, what is it that you want said here? And how can we position ourselves for this message and look at it from a new perspective 
and uh, from new eyes. And so this time there were 400 years of silence. Where between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were 400 years of, of people seeking God. Amen? And so I wanted to look at how Jesus chose to enter into the world. He was at the highest places, and he lowered himself to come and be among us. Amen? So Jesus made his entrance, and the vessel he chose to make his entrance through. And so I studied and looked at this life of Mary. So I asked myself, why Mary? She's not royalty. She didn't live in a palace. She didn't have political power or position. She was not a person of influence. So why Mary? She was a poor Galilean girl. Mary and Joseph were so poor that when it became time for her uh, and Joseph to, to offer up a sacrifice for Jesus, their firstborn, as it was required by Levitical law, they didn't even have enough money for the lamb for the sacrifice. So they had to sacrifice two birds. So why Mary? She was barely a teenager. She was too young to be noticed. She had no great accomplishments. Nothing that would catch your eye on a resume. There must have been thousands of people who were more impressive. So why Mary? She wasn't especially educated. I mean, who was she to raise up and teach the Son of God? And she wasn't engaged to, to be married to a ruler or, or a king, but a simple carpenter. So why Mary? The incarnation is the most significant event in human history. Don't you think God should have been a little more selective? A little more picky? So honestly, we don't know much about Mary. If you take all that was written about her in the scriptures and you put it together, there really isn't enough for a small biography. So when Mary does show up, she tends to take more of a, a cameo appearance. She rarely gets a speaking part. And we know a lot about, we don't really know a lot about her life before Jesus was born. We don't really know about how she raised him. We don't even know about when and where she passed away. When Luke chapters 1 and 2 tells us the most about the life of Mary. But really those chapters aren't even about her. She's not the main character. She's just part of the supporting cast. And what becomes clear when you study the life of Mary is that this is how she would have wanted it. There are many beautiful ways to describe Mary, the mother of Jesus, but what stands out the most is her humility. Amen? So the title of the message today is Inconceivable. So when we think about the incarnation, we struggle with our human minds, you know, grasping the concept, grasping of how this could happen. So I looked up the, the word inconceivable in the Oxford Dictionary. It says not capable of being imagined or grasped mentally. It's unbelievable. So Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. It says, now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's uh, pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed or engaged to a man who was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, Nazareth was not a booming metropolis. It wasn't this, this city with a, with a great economy. There were no amusement parks. There was no Chick-fil-A. There was nothing like that. It was a poor town barely seen on a map, it was rejected and despised by the Jews. So it's just this really humble town where nothing really great happens there. Can you guys identify with that? Maybe you're in a situation where you feel like nothing is happening. Generation after generation, you've, you've been in a position, and it's like nothing is happening. And so we look at Nazareth, and actually if you look at John 1, 45 through 46, this is the disciples here. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him 
whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. So people will look at your circumstances and write you off. People will look at, you know, you're no good, right? Your father only got to this place, or your mother only got to this place in life. Your upbringing, you're from a poor upbringing, and there's no real hope for you. I've been in situations where I work with, uh, when I was working in missions, college uh, students, this first-generation college students, and just hearing the stories from them, how people weren't really expecting them to go past high school. And so God is choosing places like this. God is choosing atmospheres to come into where you think that there is death in that area. God is speaking life into that area. Amen? Amen. So God will use people or things that the world has disregarded and use them in a mighty way to put shame to the wise. Some people will, will come to you prideful and just try to shoot you down. And they think that they're wise and they think that they know better. And so God will use you in a mighty way to put shame to the wise. 1 Corinthians 1, 28 through 30. But God, actually starting in 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Just like Mary. God chose Mary because she was a vessel. She was obedient. She was humble. She had faith. Amen? And God chose her. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Going back to Luke, continuing there in Luke 1, 29. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered her and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Elizabeth was called barren. Nazareth was called barren. Nothing good can come out of these situations. It's impossible. It's inconceivable to think that anything good can come out of these vessels. Even Elizabeth called herself barren. But God, through God, anything is possible. He will take the things that you have called barren or others have called barren and will bring them to light and will use them in a mighty way to glorify him. Amen. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let it be to me. I will be the vessel. I will be the vessel. Amen? But Mary said, how can this be? The Bible says that this is possible because God's spirit will overshadow Mary. This same word is used in the Old Testament to refer to God's presence in the most holy place, in the tabernacle. And the temple. In Exodus 40, 35, it says, And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting 
because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God will literally reside in Mary. God will literally reside in Mary. The light of the world resides in each and every one of us. Amen? This light of the world, we are the vessels that carry the Son of God to earth. Just as it literally resided in Mary, this light also resides in every single one of us. He is the light of the world. But just as God literally resided in Mary, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 7.14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. What does it mean? God with us. So Jesus humbled himself. He was in the most high, the most holy of places, and he humbled himself to fulfill the prophecy that was given to us in the Old Testament. So he humbled himself. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. This is the humbled and exalted Christ. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is humility that, that, um, that is talking about here. Whom being the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became, and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. Glory to God. A book was uh, shared with me by Heidi Shaw. This book is called Gateway to God's Blessings, and it's from Derek Prince, and I want to read an excerpt from that. When I was reading and studying and preparing for this message, This passage is kind of unfolded and unpacked in this book. So I'm going to read this to you. It's talking about the seven steps down and the seven steps up, which was referred to in this passage. So in Scripture, seven is often the number signifying completion or perfection. It is also associated with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, seven steps down. Step number one, he emptied himself laying aside all attributes of divinity. Step two, he took the form of a servant. He who was the Lord became the servant. Step three, he was made in human likeness. He became a man, not an angel. Step four, he was found in appearance as a man. When Jesus walked the streets of his hometown, Nazareth, There was nothing special or externally obvious to distinguish him from all the other people of the town. When Peter ultimately identified him as the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. There was nothing in his external appearance to make him different from the other men of his day. Step five, he humbled himself. Not only was he a man of his time, but he was a humble man of his time. He was not a prince. He was not a wealthy man, a political leader, or a military commander. He had none of those aspects or functions that tend to impress people in the natural. Step six, he became obedient to death. He not only lived as a man, but he died as a man too. He died on a cross, the ultimate instrument of humiliation, shame, rejection, In the agony, Jesus took seven steps down to the lowest place of all, the place of the criminal. He was rejected by men and even rejected by God, the Father, on our account. Philippians 2.9 begins with the word, therefore. That is because this is the outworking of a divine law 
not just an accident. Jesus was not exalted because he was God's son. He was exalted because he earned exaltation. Even Jesus was subject to this law. There is no one in the universe who is not subject to this law. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. So Jesus, this is his seven steps up. Step number one, God exalted him to the highest place. Step number two, God gave him the name that is above every name. There is only one name that is above every name, and that is the name of Jesus. Step three, at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Steps four, five, and six are the different areas of the universe in which knees will bow. Step one, in heaven. Step two, on earth. Step, I'm sorry, step five, on earth. Step six, under the earth. The three great areas of the universe are all going to acknowledge the exaltation of the glory of God the Father. Step seven, finally, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus took seven steps down and seven steps up, but he had to do so in that order. He could not take the steps up until he had taken the steps down. But the steps were in order. The steps were in order. Praise the Lord. And so in Psalm 37, 23, it says there that the, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. The steps are ordered. Your steps are ordered. Amen? And so Jesus, he had to take the steps down in order to take the steps up. The steps were ordered. See, we're not promised that this life is going to be easy. We're not promised that, that everything is going to be simple. But the steps don't belong to us. We don't order the steps. The steps are ordered by who? The Lord. The steps are ordered by the Lord. So you're going to experience trials. You're going to experience heartache. You're going to experience challenges in life. But your steps are in order. See, God is the God of the hills, and he's the God of the valleys. He's the God of the steps up. He's the God of the steps down. He is Emmanuel. The promise is he is with us, whether we are taking steps down or whether we are taking steps up. He is Emmanuel, and he is God with us. The light of the world lives inside of you. And so God is saying that you're going to take steps down sometimes. And it's going to be hard Sometimes, Well, whether I'm taking you down or whether I'm raising you up, your steps are in order. I don't know who this is for, but your steps are in order. I don't know who this is for, but you've been going down. You've been going down the steps, step after step, and you feel like all hope is lost. And you keep on going in this direction downward and downward and downward. But your steps are in order. And God is there with you. And there's something that you need on that bottom step. There is something that you need as you keep going down these steps and keep going down these steps. There's something that you need that is down here that God is going to use to exalt you and lift you up to the highest places that, is, that God is going to glorify you and to glorify his name. And you are going to be able to minister to people because you are that vessel and he's going to raise you up. But there are steps that you're going, that you're going to need before you, you are exalted. Some of us have been stuck on a step. We've been stuck on a step for a while. And we haven't been moving, but God is still with you. He's with you. Church, he's with you. 
and you've been stuck on a step. And because Maybe it's because you're in a season of life where you're in the waiting for God to tell you to move. But if God is telling you to move and you're still stuck on a step, be obedient to that call and take the step. Even if it's a step down, just become that vessel. Become that humble servant so the light can shine within you. Amen? Amen. 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 Isaiah 60. When I walk around the sanctuary, I walk and I pray, and there's so many of us that have been praying, especially in these prayer gatherings. We walk around and we're praying over every seat. And we'll sit in these seats and we'll pray over each and every one of you. And as I was uh, walking this past week, I've been reading this, this scripture passage in Isaiah 60. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And I must have read this so many times over and over again. But there was something that happened this past Monday where, where God brought this to light. It says, arise, arise, shine, for your light has come. And it was different than any other verse that I had been reading in preparation for this message. The way I describe it, it's, it's that moment that, that God breathes life on. There's this light that's illuminating from the passage. It's emanating uh, from what I just read. It gripped me, and it, it, it spoke to me, and it grabbed hold of me. And so... It spoke to me so deeply that, that it changed me, that it literally changed me. It's, it's like he was changing my perception of, of how I viewed the church and what is possible in my lifetime. And it began to uproot some things in there just by reading the scripture. And we're going to read these verses, just the first uh, handful of verses. But he began to, to, to speak to me. Layer after layer after layer after layer, and, and it will affect every aspect of my life moving forward simply because he breathed life on the scripture. So Isaiah 60, it says, arise, shine, for your light has come. So let's stop right there. Jesus is the light that enlightens every person that comes into the world. John chapter 1, he is the light that enlightens every person into the world. It says, arise, shine, because your light has come. Listen, there's not another light that's coming. Amen? Amen? This is a right now word. And it's vital that we see in the Old Testament, Isaiah was looking to our day, and he was giving us insight. He was giving us food that would nourish into... Um, Nourish us into the expansion of the things of God, into the kingdom of God. So he's given us a statement, arise, shine. In other words, you have a responsibility because your light has come. So get back to work and do what you're supposed to do. Rise, show the nature of the love of Christ, the power of Christ. Take your posture and just see what happens? Things that you, you were just thinking are, are inconceivable, that are impossible. Arise and shine. Your light has come. And just take your posture. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. So here's the deal. You take your position in God as his glory to your position. Does that make sense? You've been given a glory. Every part of God's creation has been given a measure of glory. So it's almost like stand in your glory and I'll add mine. It's like he releases that glory. It's the manifest presence of Jesus. My goodness, what can be better than that? For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles, or some translations say the nations, shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. Do you remember when, when Jesus said, lift up your eyes and see the fields are ripe unto harvest. This is in John chapter 4. This is a sister passage to this. 
It says lifting up your eyes. Here's what happens. We get so buried in, in, in conflict. We get so buried in, in personal uh, matters. We get so buried uh, with difficulties that our vision gets cast down and get, it gets cast down and down and down and down. And he says lift up your eyes because it's in the lifting of your eyes that gives you clarity in order to look down on your situation with clear perspective. Lift up your eyes. Arise and shine. Lift up your eyes. It says they all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. Now the abundance may be resources and maybe opportunities and favor and all that stuff. And, and, and I'm into that and it's wonderful. But the real treasure, the real wealth of the nations is people. It's souls. Amen? It says the wealth of the nations shall come to you. And it's not about you and me building our personal empire. It's about the king of glory being exalted as the great harvester in the earth. It's the harvester of souls. And he's saying, arise and shine. Take your place. I'll add my glory. And when that combination of heaven and earth works together, nations will come. Kings, the leaders of industry, wise men, shepherds, people from all over the world will come. And the whole point is they will see the glory that is upon you, just as the glory was upon Mary. And Jesus Christ, people came from all over the place. There were no advertisements. There was the star in the sky, and people came to see the light of the world. Amen? Amen. And so these people, I will, I will put them in them a passion and a desire that, that they don't even know how to explain or describe. It's, it's inconceivable to think about. And it is for what you will be carrying as the glory rests upon you. They will leave their position or posture and they will come to you. It says, lift up your eyes and look. Your daughters are coming. Your sons are coming. The wealth of the nations, the people, the masses of people will come to you. So how in the world, if God speaks to you about that, can you be impressed about a crisis, any crisis that happens in the world? It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm unmoved. It doesn't mean that I'm not impacted. It just means I'm not impressed. It doesn't mean that there's no compassion. No, we, we respond to these things with prayer. And we step into these things redemptively to see God work his purposes out. But the moment a crisis becomes bigger in my own consciousness than my awareness with God, I will live in reaction to that problem. And if I live in reaction to the problem, the devil has had influence in setting my agenda. And he is not worthy in influencing my agenda at all. So the Lord is merciful and has driven a stake in the ground that has influenced my hope, my anticipation, my expectation for what will happen in the earth, not denying difficulty, not denying challenges, not denying the, the trials and just saying in the midst of it, God is to be glorified. And the church will come to this place of purity, this place of unity, and to a place of great strength. And the nations will see it. The kings will see it. And once they do, they will come. But it comes back to you, and it comes back to me. Stop waiting for another prophetic word. Right? I mean, I love the prophetic, but stop waiting for your word that will bring you breakthrough. You don't need it. Just obey God. Do what he said. Just get up. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. Well, try your best. 
Just do the best that you can do, right? Take your position and see what's possible. Let's go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to end um, this word back in, in Luke chapter 1, picking up in verse 45. And so uh, what's really awesome uh, about the, the remainder of this from 45 to 55 is uh, Mary has gone to see Elizabeth. And um, this is at the end of the greeting. So Mary did not, did not send an email before or did not call ahead and say, hey, I'm coming. You should, you, should, you should know what happened to me. I can't wait to explain it to you when I get there, but here's a highlight. None of that happened. She just went to see him. And in the greeting, Elizabeth knew the babe, John the Baptist, leapt in her womb at the sound of her voice. And Elizabeth says, blessed is she who believed. Blessed is she that believed. Elizabeth didn't believe that she could conceive. But Mary believed. Blessed is she who believed. For the Lord There will be a fulfillment of those things which were told to her from the Lord. Blessed is she who believed. And in response to that, there's a song of Mary. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your only son, the son of God, the light of the world the light of the world that you have blessed us with and have, have given us. And so we are thankful and we look to Mary as this beautiful vessel, this faithful vessel, this obedient vessel, this humble servant and the way that you sent your son to this earth, that it will put us in a position to be humble servants of God. That that light, that same light that lived inside of, of Mary will be that same light and is that same light that lives inside of each and every one of us. That we will lift our eyes. That we will lift our eyes and focus on Jesus. That you will be magnified and you will be glorified not because we want to be exalted. But that we want to glorify you. And you order our steps, God. You order the steps that we walk down. And we are so thankful that you are the God of the hills and the valleys. And we are so thankful that, that, that Jesus is Emmanuel and he will be with us through the tough times and through the celebrations. And so we just glorify your name here today as we prepare for the Christmas season, the season of giving. And we acknowledge that the greatest gift of all has already been given to us. And so we just honor you and we give you praise for for the example that you've given to us through these little children and how they have received the kingdom of God. And I pray that each and every one of us 
will receive the kingdom of God as a little child. And in Jesus' name, we glorify you. We honor you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Let's give him some praise this morning. Come on. Go forth. Have an incredible week. And God willing, we will see you next week. If anyone needs prayer, please come to the front. But y'all have a good, blessed week. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.